During a broadcast of ABC Evening News, anchor Frank Reynolds told viewers to be prepared for tomorrow and that they would witness the start of a glorious adventure. Word spread quickly throughout the country and civilians invited friends and family to their homes in anticipation of the next day. Although no details of this glorious adventure were known, it was widely presumed to be another exciting TV announcement from President James Dean. Watching parties were organized in living rooms across America, and on the evening of May 13, 1969, after the ABC Evening News ended, televisions were closely watched with millions of unblinking eyes. No one wanted to miss what President Dean had to say. James Dean's America is hell. But you still don't believe us. You'll hear the truth from James Dean himself. Following the broadcast, air raid sirens activated across all 50 states. The sirens blared at a far greater volume than usual and burst the eardrums of every civilian within a four-mile radius. The resulting panic triggered severe overcrowding at bomb shelters and deadly stampedes in the streets. Thousands were trampled and hospitals were overwhelmed within the hour. Fires broke out in all major cities and cars left running in the streets produced lethal amounts of carbon monoxide which flowed into poorly ventilated bomb shelters and suburban homes. In Washington, D.C., the White House was placed into lockdown immediately after the TV hijacking, and President Dean was rushed to a maximum security underground bunker. Able to hear the anguished screams of civilians in the streets above, Dean refused to stay in the shelter. When carbon monoxide alarms went off in the bunker, he urged his staff to exit the White House with him and shut off the vehicles left on the roadways. With a phone call, Dean mobilized the National Guard to assist with the deactivation of the millions of parked vehicles across America. Several more phone calls to high-ranking military officials and world leaders revealed that no nuclear missiles had in fact been launched. President Dean soon realized that the air raid sirens had been hijacked by a domestic organization and immediately ordered all forces of the military to disable every active siren in the nation. When military technicians arrived at the location of the sirens, they found that the bodies of prior technicians, who had perished from the combination of stress and the sirens' sheer volume, piled so high as to have formed a ramp to the top of the speakers. The overcrowding of streets by civilians in unaccompanied cars frequently blocked the path of emergency vehicles and prolonged the process of disarming the sirens. Against his advisor's wishes, President Dean tasked himself with the deactivation of an air siren near the White House. Although he would accomplish the task fairly quickly, Dean sustained permanent ear damage and was rendered fully deaf. The sheer volume had also caused countless blood vessels in his body to burst and produce several abdominal hernias. His condition was shared among the millions of other Americans who had been near the sirens at the time of their activation. Three hours would pass before all air raid sirens would be fully disabled. The next morning, at the advice of federal authorities, Civilians slowly made their way from the shelters back to their homes. Although some continued to stay in the shelters for fear of radioactive fallout, most accepted the explanation given by military officials over the radio. There is no nuclear holocaust. A domestic terrorist organization hijacked the sirens of America. The streets were littered with bodies and automobiles. The National Guard handed out blindfolds to the young, sick, and elderly as they exited the shelters to prevent the scenes of bloodshed from causing fainting spells and heart attacks. At the Walt Disney Medical Center, 
physicians examined President Dean and other members of his staff who helped disarm the sirens. All were diagnosed with severe hearing loss. Against his doctor's advice, Dean insisted on issuing a public statement on the traumatic events that had transpired. Although he initially wanted to appear on live television, a glance at the mirror discouraged him as he saw the countless bruises and tears present on his skin due to the intensity of the sirens. In coordination with technicians from the Department of Defense, President Dean instead organized a large-scale radio broadcast utilizing the very air raid sirens they had disabled. Later that night, a bruised Frank Reynolds would announce on ABC Evening News that Dean would speak through the sirens and that captions would be displayed simultaneously on television for viewers who were hard of hearing. Next week, hundreds of thousands of anti-deaners would be apprehended and sent to correctional facilities around the United States. These facilities, meant for the anti-American, were aptly located near or at national monuments in order to symbolize a return to American virtues. Most would stay for merely a few weeks before being released again. Friends and family of rehabilitated anti-deaners frequently claimed that they would have improved personalities, no recollection of their past criminal activities, and even slightly altered physical appearances. These methods were so effective in calming the terrorist that many innocent civilians requested themselves to be sent to these facilities in hopes of radically changing their lives. However, federal authorities would deny any admission to those who were not affiliated with the ADA. During one address, President Dean acknowledged the high volume of requests from the public. On the morning of May 22nd, nine days after the disaster, President Dean received a state-of-the-art hearing implant from Maze Machines, an up-and-coming tech company. Around noon at the Walt Disney Medical Center, the device was surgically inserted into Dean. 
the sound quality of the implant and the speedy nature of the surgery inspired Dean to imagine a new government department, which would be able to oversee the mass production and distribution of quality hearing implants to the American public. That evening, President Dean requested an emergency session of Congress and proposed the ambitious project. I can't hear a damn thing. Did you hear me? I can't hear a damn thing. Neither can you, or you, or you, or you. It doesn't matter whether you are near the sirens or not. None of you are listening. We need to bring together those technology companies to build and send hearing devices that the public needs. Hearing devices that you yourself need. And through a collaboration with the Department of Health, we can give back to the people where our failures took away. We can let a mother hear her child laugh again. And let a man hear his dog again. We can give everyone their hearing again. And who's stopping you? Listen to the public. You're all about deadlines, too. So here's one. By July 4th, I want every American to hear the fireworks. Due to a malfunction in his auditory implants, Dean was unable to hear himself and as a result spoke much louder on the Senate floor than on previous occasions. The volume of his speech, which greatly amplified his compassion for the American people, profoundly affected the senators. And in the early hours of May 23, 1969, after 10 hours of discussion, the Department of Technology was approved. It was the fastest an executive department had ever been established. By May 27, all persons with hearing loss attributed to the anti-Dean disaster would be eligible for the surgical implantation of a hearing device free of charge. Mass operating rooms would be established throughout the U.S., able to house over a thousand patients at once. The use of surgical androids was approved on June 6, which increased the number of surgeries performed per day over 250 percent. Once all victims had been treated, those with deafness unrelated to the disaster also became eligible for the surgery. On July 4, it was announced that there was no incidence of severe hearing loss in the country. The United States was the first nation in the world to eradicate deafness. The achievement had been expected for some time since its first mention during Dean's congressional address. In preparation, many health organizations, both domestic and international, had prepared to host banquets for Dean and grant awards to him and his staff. However, President Dean spent the entirety of Independence Day racing cars with close friend Richard Nixon at a local speedway. Though many would cite the recovery from the anti-Dean disaster as James Dean's finest hour, the president was never willing to accept responsibility. All we did was fix some ears. Thank you.